Um, hello, everybody. Is everybody all well fed and not too snappy because you haven't eaten? Everything good at this point? Okay. Um, well, thank you, Andres, for the very lovely introduction. Um, my name is Zach Fayish, and I am an electrical engineer from Canada, and I have always wanted to be an astronaut. That is what it really comes down to. That is what has effectively driven me to do pretty much every major decision I've made in my life. It's why I've studied engineering. It's why I came down to Starship Congress in 2015, uh, 2013, sorry, now it's 2015, and why I wanted to get involved with Icarus when I had the opportunity. Um, you see, a long, long time ago um, in Toronto, uh, my father bought me a copy of Star Wars, and I said, this is Phenomenal. I would love to be that person. I would love to be that person exploring new worlds and seeing amazing things. And I'm not going to mention the force because this is a science conference. But long story short, I wanted to be that person who would go out and explore and, and learn these amazing things. But I had no idea how to get there. Um, and this is, as it turns out, as I, as I grew and, and studied engineering and as I studied more and more science and as I learned more about the industry, I found out that this was the, the problem everywhere. I, I mean, the, you're here today almost certainly because you're interested in space travel and you are interested in understanding how we can make our amazing dreams of interstellar space flight, deep space flight, even flying to the moon regularly a reality and you want to make that happen. In a much simpler case, an astronaut, which is hilariously not simple, the question still arises, how do you get there? How does, how does that become your profession? I, I mean, in the entire history of our species, just over 100 people have ever had that job. There is no way to do it. There's no program in school where you study astronautics for five years. You go get a master's in astronautics. You get a PhD in I live in space-ology. And then you go work on the ISS for a few years. That, that isn't how it works. There is no route to that. And if that sounds hard, look at what we're trying to tackle today as an organization. We're trying to tackle interstellar spaceflight. There is not a single machine we've ever built that has traveled to another star system, nevertheless a person. So the problem that I, I see myself facing in terms of going where I want in my career is nothing by comparison to the problems we face as an industry in terms of making these amazing things become a reality. And the question naturally has to become, how do we realize these incredible dreams? How do we realize these amazing ideas we have? And, and frankly, it comes down to, how do we get there? How do we, how do we make these things happen? Um, now, this question is effectively going to be the, the basis of my talk, and I'm going to describe Project Voyager in the scope of an answer to this question. Um, and I do, I think I have come up with an answer to sort of this, this what I think is the most pressing question in the space industry today. Um, and I'd like to explain that a little bit. You see, I have come to the conclusion that, uh, at least through my relatively short time working in the space industry, I've come to the conclusion that the biggest problem is one of focus in the space industry. Um, and amongst all of us who are not only working in it, but enthusiastic about it. Artists, uh, uh, people of different professions who are enthusiastic about the space industry all have a similar hang up. And that hang up, quite simply, is we look at these amazing concepts. We look at concepts like what the Eagle Works team is working with uh, at NASA, the warp drive concepts. We think of interstellar space flight and we see this amazing and nigh unattainable thing, which we'd like to make a reality and we work in many ways to say, okay, if we had technology A, we would do it. If we had technology B, we could solve this other problem. But we don't have those technologies. And it's very easy as a young professional or as a student um, or even as, a, as an experienced professional to not be able to get past that. It is, it is working, it's just a black screen. Um, so it, it's very difficult to get, not, get, not get hung up on the, in, in some ways, impossibilities within our lifetime of seeing certain things become real, seeing a warp ship that travels with hundreds of people on board to another star system become real. That's, that's hard, and I think it really comes down to understanding, and not only understanding, but really celebrating each step along the way, each incremental little step, which brings me to really what this talk solution comes to, the idea that incremental tools and the development of tools begets the development of more tools and more technologies. And focusing and celebrating each of these little steps along the way is how we tackle these problems and how we keep people really invested and believing that we can individually contribute to interstellar spaceflight. Even if it's 100 years away, everything you do today, even as a student, can contribute. 
So again, we have to understand what problems we're dealing with to break it down. Uh, uh, Dr. Armstrong this morning mentioned that sometimes we have a problem of focusing too deep as, as scientists or engineers. I, I tend to agree, but f based on the fact that I'm an engineer and this is my training, I like to break problems down. So let's look at the different problems with space flight and better understand how we can break it down, how we can get rid of this problem of only focusing on the top level successes and bring it down to something where each success makes a difference. The first problem is distance. Frankly, the nearest star to us is over four light years away. That's really far. If, if the sentence four light years away doesn't already make you shake with how impossibly far that is, it's, it's very difficult to explain. And now imagine trying to explain that to a school child in a meaningful way. It's difficult. It's, it's almost impossible to convince them that light travels faster than you could possibly understand and you know, do that for four years and you might see another star. That's hard. It's, it's a hard thing to grasp. Another problem is propulsion. Once we have distance to deal with, we have propulsion to deal with. How do we get that far? How do we get that far quickly? How do we get that far with that much mass? How do we get off the planet we started on, assuming we start on the planet? These are all problems that we need to solve. There's the problem of navigation. There's the problem with mission planning and figuring out how to get there. Even if you have all of this fuel, even if you have this amazing ship using technology that we don't know about yet, how do you get there? How do you figure out how to go? And lastly, there's a problem in education, which is very similar to what I'm talking about today, the focus on what counts as a success in the industry. The focus on uh, what it takes to become good at, the spa at space engineering or space sciences, as well as how we teach students today. Because a mathematically rigorous approach to orbital dynamics is the standard way to teach. That makes perfect sense, of course, because they need to understand how to do it. But it doesn't impart them with a useful intuition about orbital dynamics. It doesn't impart them with an intuition to look at a map and say, this is how I would get to Jupiter in the next year. And that's something that maybe we can solve. And so. Looking at these problems, um, I, I sat down about a, a year and a half ago and said, oh, why, why not we come up with something to do to maybe get me practicing my C++ because God knows I need it, and maybe learning a little more about orbital dynamics so I can move forward. And I started a very small coding project, which became something very different. And that project is now what we are using, my team and I, to try to tackle one of these problems or two of these problems in an individual level, and it's called Project Voyager. Um, Voyager is, in essence, a space mission planning suite. It's meant to be used for educational purposes and for young startup industry. It allows mission planning over distances from interplanetary within our solar system, um, cislunar and to the moons of other planets, and eventually even to other star systems within 15 light years. That's, that's the scope of our software that we're developing. Um, now, as I said, it's meant to be used in education. It's meant to be used in industry. For education, we're intentionally designing it to have the simplest learning curve possible. We're using concepts out of video game design, which is becoming a much larger industry, and we can utilize that for science software development because they are very good at designing things to be easily accessible. That takes care of part of the education problem. If we can use visual software to teach students orbital dynamics, their intuition goes up a lot. Show of hands, how many people have heard of a, a piece of software called Kerbal Space Program? Awesome. How many people have played with it? Awesome. How great is it? Yes, OK, perfect. So <laughs> thank you. OK, so Kerbal is a great game. But inherently, it's a game. And because of that, it's very difficult to move into the realm of reality from a teaching perspective. To approach the uh, educational institutions and say, you know, we can use this for teaching is difficult. Where we can come in is effectively to say, well, we have a software that works very much the same way. You don't have to design the ships in a component structure, though that it will be available eventually. It, but you can actually teach them from the ground up how to make an orbit work, how to get from point A to point B anywhere in our solar system and eventually well beyond. Now, Voyager started, as I said, about a year and a half ago, or almost two years ago now, as a very small coding project. I was in my fourth year of engineering at UFT. I'm an electrical engineer. And I wanted to relearn C++, which is a programming language, and frankly, because I was very bad at it. And I thought, oh, you know what? I'll build an in-body gravitational simulator. I will build a gravity sim so I can practice my orbital dynamics. I can practice um, some space flight stuff and maybe some um, space trajectory work. And I can build a really cool program, I said, fiddling away at my computer and making absolutely nothing that worked. Uh, I went down to Starship Congress in 2013, met some absolutely wonderful people, uh, most namely Mike Mongo and Andreas, who I talked to for the entirety of the conference, and who thereafter I stayed in pretty good touch with. 
I was graduating university and about a few months later, and this project was still going, and it had started gaining some interest, so I said, you know, maybe, maybe I should do something with this. Talking to the guys from Icarus, we decided that we could actually spin it into a full-blown project under Icarus. This little simulator software I designed could become what I've described Voyager to be. We, we scoped it out, we built that up, and I started building a team. Um, after Starship Congress, I started building a very, very good team. And my team is entirely made up of students, undergraduate and graduate students from the University of Toronto and surrounding universities within the general Toronto area. And we've started taking on not only engineers and coders, but astrophysicists, uh, general physics students. We have at least one political science student, and we're starting to take on graphic artists. We have a very powerful multidisciplinary team that I'm very proud of. Yes, you three. I'm very proud of. And they're doing absolutely amazing work. And we've been working on this now for a year and a half, developing the software from the ground up. Now, my team, as I say, is, is made up of a very multidisciplinary group. And the benefit of working with students is twofold. First, going to the issue of celebrating each step it provides me the opportunity to give students in undergraduate studies an opportunity that I didn't have when I was studying, which is to be part of what is, is becoming a very meaningful space-related project that might have legitimate reper repercussions, positive ones, within the industry and help the industry grow. The second benefit of recruiting students is, as ironic as this may sound, they usually know absolutely nothing about what you're talking about when you start. Um, they have no idea what they're doing, and to be clear, neither did I. But this, but this is the fun part. Students, more than anyone else, are dedicated to learning. That's their job, effectively, for, until that point in their life, until they finish uh, high school, if they leave then, or university, or perhaps graduate studies. That's all they do. They learn new things. And if you give them something that they're interested to learn about, they will become experts on that subject. And what they can create with those quickly developed expertise is unbelievable. Voyager used to be... Um, several really crappy lines of code on my computer. It used to be a couple of line drawings in paint, um, really bad line drawings in paint, I apologize. It used to be some even worse line drawings in paint to describe orbital dynamics. I give this to some members of my team early on. We discuss how these things work. We do about two weeks of research in orbital dynamics, and we have a functional simulation of the same thing in patched conics, accurate with an impulse burn. This is the power of what you can do when you have students working on something. And what's important for those students and those young professionals is that these things have major repercussions. Everything that they learn, everything that they build through this intake of knowledge and through the belief that what they're building is actually potentially important is they build something that will actually be intentionally important. It's something that can actually affect industry in a positive way. Now, Voyager, what we intend to do with it is to provide it to academic institutions, to provide it to young industry. Um, we're actually moving a little bit into an interesting position with our relationship with Icarus and that Voyager is becoming a company in Toronto very shortly, um, which I'm very excited to say. The project has moved much further than I could ever have imagined it going. Now, I did promise, <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I would like to give a brief demonstration of the software because I talk about it a lot and a lot of my talking, I find, doesn't give a good enough indication of what exactly we're doing. So I'd like to show you Project Voyager as it exists about two weeks ago. The, the most recent version has some bugs, so forgive us. But I'll show you Voyager as it exists about now um, in the three major components that make up the software. The first is the space map, as I mentioned. Our map encompasses the entire solar system um, in a 3D interface built on the Unity game engine. This allows us to port it to any output um, system. We can put it on Linux, uh, put it on your iPad, put it on an Android phone, and, as has been suggested recently, and as we are going with, make it a web-based application so that the average usage of the computer, or so the average strength of the computer a person is using doesn't matter because it'll all be powered server-side. This means anyone in the world could use the software with a crappy computer and access to the internet which is phenomenal because it means that not only does this potentially give a new tool to members of industry, it has reach, oh, this is a buggy video. Well, that's unfortunate, it'll bounce around. The point is the map reaches out to approximately Pluto's distance and range. We have all of the major planets as well as Pluto because we all have a deep uh, affection for Pluto. Um, but it reaches all the major planets in the solar system as well as all of their moons. This is all data pulled directly from the NASA um, Horizons database and we're using ephemeris data to produce Keplerian orbits of the planets. This is an inaccurate approximation. We know this and we're currently working on upgrading the entire system to directly pull ephemeris data constantly, everyday updating. And since it's a web-based application, the server updates, everybody else's updates as well. We can have accurate running of the entire um, solar system 
for the next 50 years until the new frame of reference is devised, J probably 2050, at which point we can upgrade with the system because it's already hooked to the database. The map is very um, inclusive. We have all of the gravitational effects of every body, major and minor, being accounted for in the system. I'm sorry this is so buggy. Okay, if you're all really nice after the conference, I'll actually demo the software for you in person. Um, but, if, whoa, hello, okay. <laughs> now, now I'm embarrassed. Long story short, the Voyager software keeps track of all of these things in a detailed map, and this map itself is dynamic. It wouldn't be very useful if it was just a uh, basic map. Our start date right now, which is arbitrary, is something like August 1st, 2014, but we can move time forward and backwards through it and get it done. If you guys can excuse me for a second, I'm gonna try to fix this, because it's actually a very nice video. It's actually a very nice video, and I would very much like to share it with you. There we go. Better? Okay. Okay, awesome. So the map itself is dynamic. We can effectively produce or reproduce the motion of any given planet over any time frame within the J2000 frame of reference on the Horizons database. And their positions right now are fairly accurate with the pulling of the ephemeris data proper, which we should have within the month. They will be as accurate as we can have based on the data available to us. And as our knowledge of the solar system, and it's happening again, well, as our knowledge of the solar system increases and we get uh, more information on more asteroids, more comets, new systems, yes, Jeff? Okay, fair enough. Sorry guys, this is stunting the talk a little bit. And now the computer's frozen. Okay, well you know what, we'll skip the video on that one just to keep it safe for now. Um, now in the map, it wouldn't be useful if it was just a map. We have uh, an application of patched conics. Now, for those of you who aren't aware, patched conics is one of the simpler ways in which you can plan um, spaceship missions, do um, vector mathematics to determine where a ship will go over time in space. It's based on the fairly simple principle that at any point in the universe, there's only two objects. There's the ship you're on, or the ship you are, and the planet that's proportionately, based on its mass, closest to you. This approximation works very, very well for doing things very quickly and can be solved algebraically, which means that we can not only solve it forward and say, you know, I do a burn of this much thrust at a certain point in the map and then I see the orbit move immediately to the thing. I wish I could show you now. But um, you will see the orbit move immediately because it's part of the visual interface. The, the, the speed of these calculations is effectively instantaneous because in patch conics they're all algebraic which is amazing. We have several methods we're using to solve depending on the types of orbits, but all of them have been rigorously tested and are continuing to be rigorously tested so that we can meet flight quality. We're in communication with a couple of organizations that do independent software verification, specifically so that we can handle um, the level of accuracy that's expected in the industry. Now, this is great. The, the patch conics is wonderful because we can effectively use this to plan missions and get a good idea of how much delta V we need to acquire and then based on your ship, how much fuel you need for any mission within the solar system. But patched conics, as I said, suffer from some inherent inaccuracies. Uh, things like Lagrange points cannot be appropriately modeled in this system because they require at least three bodies. So the simulator that I built, the crappy little simulator in C++ makes an appearance again. Um, the simulator has been completely redesigned by someone who is not me and has been built into the system so that we can take the basic mission plans that people come up with and then much more accurately run them with a high caliber simulator through a full n-body gravitational simulation using the mass of every object in the solar system that we're accounting for, and that, again, to be clear, can be completely extended. Um, we can create much more accurate approximations over time. So if we have a basic mission here, which for some reason now is working, in a fairly high orbit around the Earth, and we want to simulate that, we'll simply set up the parameters, say when we want to start the simulation, when we want it to end. We'll choose the step size. We're using, um, just in case anybody's interested, a runge neustrom 10th order approximation that does not have a variable step size. So we choose the length of time we want to simulate for in real life time, choose the step size, and we're going to choose one minute here, and I'm going to fast forward the video because it actually takes about two minutes to simulate. And it'll overlay on the map, oh come on, it'll overlay on the map a more detailed simulation. The blue line, the light blue line that you see here that's making a sinusoid around Earth's orbit is exactly what you would expect in an accurate simulation of a circular orbit around Earth. So we can do these simulations. We can do the simulations for maneuvers. We account for them based on time of flight. The long and short of it really is that we are starting to build, and we've basically built, all of the base functionality we need into the software. Now, there's a long way to go with it. 
to be clear, there's, there's a very long way to go with the software. We are not only in terms of development, but in terms of business work, in terms of figuring out what the industry needs exactly. How do we include that functionality there? But the long and short of it is, the core physics is there. We've built the physics engine, and now it's all about extending it to create the utilities that are necessary for the industry and for education. What's wonderful about this project is that Voyager is a perfect example of an enabling technology. It's a perfect example of an enabling technology for navigation, potentially, for mission planning, and for education, which brings us back to the basic talk point, which is, again, how do we get there? Now, Voyager is a great tool for education because it enables inherent visualization and a visual nature that students don't usually get access to until much later when they can create visuals for themselves in MATLAB. It lets people play with this stuff and a very real world version of this stuff as opposed to Kerbal, which is fun, but again, very complex and not exactly realistic physics. If we can use this as a tool in high schools and universities and colleges to better teach a new generation of students how orbits work, how orbital mechanics work, how space flight works, then we have an entire generation of people who are going to be more aware of the problems and the tools that they need to be developing in the space industry. Voyager, just like the tools I was explaining more generally, begets the development of more systems. In the young space industry, and the space industry composed primarily of young startups, CubeSat companies and such, tools like Voyager that are inherently accessible, designed from the ground up to be accessible, to be visual, which means they can report on it and give reports to different people as well as external um, reports that allow people to see what they're doing and understand what they're doing these things will allow them to have a better chance in the market of surviving. So many space companies today are created and then fall apart on the basis of it's very hard to prove out a concept. With tools like this, it becomes much, much easier. With consulting services of people who are experts at this, which my team now has the competency for, we, like people can build better and more reliable systems that get us further and further along in our journey to explore space. So this really does bring us back to the basic question, which is how do we get there? And I think to, I've, I've shown you how we can really come to an answer here and what the answer is. If we can change the focus um, and instead of celebrating only the massive achievements, the final steps, if we can start teaching that you need to celebrate each individual small step, each incremental step along the way, we can show students, young professionals, <clears throat> and experienced professionals alike that you can make major, major differences in the space industry. You can bring us much closer to where we want to go. You can bring us much closer to exploring the universe, being on these massive spaceships that we dream of by working on small things, and those things have merit. Hands up, who's heard of the Rosetta mission to land on a comet? It's amazing, yes? Yeah, it's, it's amazing. On that day, I, I remember I was sitting and watching the Rosetta mission on TV because it was being streamed live, and more people than I had ever known to be interested in space were watching that mission because it was phenomenal. I mean, I, we haven't had many major space breakthroughs in my adult, adult lifetime, so I don't remember many of the ones of my youth. And that was phenomenal. So many people were excited about that, and so many people were celebrating this amazing thing that the ESA had accomplished. What I'm trying to suggest is that it's just as important that we celebrate, maybe if not to the public and the layman, within the, um, within the space industry community, we celebrate the engineers who developed the harpoon gun about a year earlier. Because without that harpoon gun, it wouldn't have been possible, despite the fact that it bounced and ended up not using it. It, it wouldn't have been possible to make that mission work without those enabling technologies. And not celebrating and not publicly saying, wow, you guys did something that gets us closer to making this work, is inherently detrimental to all of us because it allows all of us to not look at the little pictures that are necessary to make up the whole of where we want to go. So the answer to the question of this talk, how do we get there, is quite simply to put one step in front of the other, one foot in the front of the other, and move forward steadily with each other, building these enabling technologies. And before you know it, we'll be at the stars. Thank you very much. <laughs>